this was about as bizarre and as easy as it gets. So the number for me was a number that would allow me to never have to work again. I feel like we got top, top, top. I went from a sale of, you know, $500,000 to in debt. $192 million. This is Built to Sell Radio with your host, John Warlow. Okay, so what are the numbers on your company's dashboard? My guess is you look at your company's revenue and profitability, which are two great metrics to track, but there are another eight key drivers of the value of your company that go well beyond just revenue and profitability that are the things that acquirers want to know about. Going and getting your value builder score will help you look at your business through the lens of an acquirer. It takes about 15 minutes to do. Go to valuebuilder.com to get your score. You know, oftentimes on the show, we talk to people who have leveraged technology, even built technology companies, and they make for fantastic stories, oftentimes selling for incredible multiples. While those stories are interesting, I think you and I both know they don't make up the bulk of the economy. The grassroots of the business market is made up more of people like my next guest, Tom Farinacci, who built a landscaping business to 35 employees. And when he reached his magic number, he decided to sell. A couple things to be on the lookout for in this episode. Number one, I think it's an overriding theme, which is that in a lot of cases, the quietest corners of the economy are where you can make a lot of money. Uh, ones that aren't picked over by competitive interests that are effectively not glamorous businesses, but ones that can often be some of the most lucrative. Think also about the location of your company. As you'll hear in Tom's story, it was both important in terms of the companies he acquired, along with why he was acquired himself. And finally, I want you to listen for the humility in Tom's voice. You'll learn that when he reached his number, he decided to sell, even though what we many of us do is move the yardsticks. When we reach a goal, instead of just achieving and celebrating that, we move the yardsticks. In Farinacci's case, he did not do that. He sold his business for a specific reason. He will tell you that in all of the details of both his acquisitions as well as his uh, being acquired. Here to tell you the story is Tom Farinacci. Tom Farinacci, welcome to Built to Sell Radio. Oh, thank you, John. Appreciate it. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about this company, Houston Greenleaf. You guys were a landscape company. You did landscaping. Is that right? Yes, yeah, sir. Uh, we did a, uh, a variety of landscaping in, in the fact of uh, we did residential with commercial and mm -hmm. uh, we did uh, do a lot of uh, construction and installations as well. Uh, some new installations. Uh, we did a lot of, uh, I would say, uh, reconstruction installations is where we specialized in as well. Got it. What proportion of your business was residential versus commercial? Um, I would probably say at the time when we did so, we were only about 30% residential. Uh, the 70% was commercial. Kind of give you a scope of it. Uh, residential, we were doing approximately around 400 yards weekly. Um, that's just the 30%. And we had a ginormous amount of, of uh, commercial in, this, in the aspect of uh, different customers so for regular maintenance. Uh, from retail centers to hospitals to condominiums. And, and, and what proportion of your business, again, when you sold, was, was these regular maintenance contracts coming in once a week, cutting the lawn, doing the leaves, whatever, versus the one-off construction stuff? The, uh, the, probably the breakdown of it, uh, which was very key for me, I would almost say probably 90% of it was uh, reoccurring uh, income or residual income that came in weekly. Got the it. other 10% was the extra bonus uh, when, when we did some extra work. Why did you do the 10%? Why not go all in recurring revenue? Uh, like, did you, like, what was the thinking about retaining that 10%? Uh, part of the, really the reason of the 10% was uh, we weren't actually actively going out and looking for new installs. It, a lot of it was the existing customers that wanted additional enhancements uh, when we had an H we had plenty of HOAs where they wanted to go ahead and redo the design work of the entrances or uh, what's an HOA uh, homeowners association. Okay. Um, so that you're, you're mowing their basic uh, green spaces of their parks or their uh, subdivision entrances and stuff like that. 
And what and, makes you guys uh, unique? Like, what, what, why, why would someone choose Houston Greenleaf? I mean, there's a lot of landscape companies out there. Why would they choose yes. you guys over someone else? Yeah, there, there's so many of them out there. And, that, and that's the one thing. It's competition. There, there are a dime a dozen out here. But what makes yeah. it, uh, what, what pushed us, I think, was our responsiveness. Uh, when a new potential customer would call, uh, we would get on it fairly quickly. And when I say fairly quickly, we would have a phone call back within probably uh, six hours and have someone back out on their property within 24 hours. And, and this, uh, was responsiveness, this was responsiveness to customer issues or when the, you know, a new customer would call you? New customer, a new customer would call. See, the key is, is and I think in this line of business, if uh, you do good business and you do good work, you should be able to keep this customer. Um, mm -hmm. And as long as you're, you're, your um, your work is uh, top peak and, and we're not having any issues, you should be able to maintain these customers and just keep slowly building on it. So the key was is as long as we could acquire and get these new customers and then word of mouth, I've always said, is your best advertisement or your worst enemy. If you do good work, it's your best advertisement. You shouldn't have to market too much more because people are gonna say, hey, I know a great guy you want to give Greenleaf a call. And that's where we got the majority of our work from. You know, you were 30, 70 residential commercial, commercial jobs. I got to imagine they get bitted out a lot. Absolutely. They do. Um, they surely do. That's where it's a, it's a very competitive market. Uh, I've been blessed with being in the, in the business almost 30 years where I did, the bigger commercial bids to where we were right in the, the perfect sweet spot uh, to, to hopefully pick up a lot of these contracts. Uh, some of them, they're just too much of a lost cause where they're just so they're, they want the bottom line and, and you're in business to make money. You're not in business to break even. So uh, that was a, a very uh, tough part in, in, in this line of business to be sure you get to be profitable enough on those commercial bids. Yeah, I mean that's that's where I was going next. Like, what was your overall profitability on a percentage basis? Uh, like, what what was able to flow to the bottom line as a percentage of the top line? Uh, I would probably say close to around a twenty percent to sometimes twenty five percent. Sometimes we got thirty percent on some of these profit. Um, it just really did vary uh, because each job is different, and when you Tom, come to can I just interrupt and just make sure I'm clear? When you say 20%, are you referring to gross margin like on a job or are you referring to at the end of the year when you got your tax return done, your, pro um, like your profitability? Gross margin, not a, profit, the profitability was probably more closer to around a um, uh, 15%. Okay. Um, when, when, at the end of the year is where you're at. That you're trying to shoot. Yeah, obviously, you're trying to shoot on, on each job. You want to shoot higher, a uh, 30% or so, because you have so much overhead. That's mm -hmm. going to just take those numbers down at the end of the year for your tax return. And the, and the guys and gals doing the work in the field, the actual mowing and raking and so forth, are, are those employees? Are they subcontractors? How did you work that? No, they were all strictly employees um, and paid on, on time and a half when, when they did go over 40. Um, I had very few subcontractors that I used um, in, in this line of business. We did pretty much everything in-house. Got it. I know that you built this company through acquisition. You made a couple of acquisitions. Can we talk about, about those? Maybe describe the first one. Like, How did it come about? Um, the, the first one was more smaller when you're just trying to, to, uh, uh, grow a little bit. I, I, I kind of got, uh, I would say lackadaisical and, and then I'd get the itch. We, we need to grow. Uh, another famous, uh, friend of mine that it, it does very successful work had a great quote. If you're not growing, you're dying. Hmm. And I thought that was, that's a, that's a great point. You should be always trying to grow and expand. So I, decided the easiest way to grow the business instead of one by one was to do some acquisitions by taking a chunk and getting all of a sudden an instant presence into a, a neighborhood or an area of town that you weren't in otherwise or was tough, had a tough time breaking into otherwise. So um, around 2012, I decided to take a giant leap of faith 
and do an acquisition. And the company name at that time was Greenleaf Enterprises. And I did decide to go ahead and take over their name um, because actually they were the bigger entity at that time. And it was almost, I was going to triple my business overnight hmm. with this acquisition. So it was a real big leap of faith, um, uh, a high risk, obviously, for me. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm glad I did it because it got me going in the right direction to where after that acquisition was done, I had instant presence in areas that I never did. And the business just kept growing more and more after that. So as you looked at making this acquisition, what, it, what was it about the company that you liked like what made it strategic for you beyond just the size? What else made it interesting? Yeah, not necessarily the size. For me, it was location purposes, trying to get in certain areas that I was not, or uh, you could try to get into certain areas. But then since this business is based on hourly employees, time is money. And then it, to go over there to drive for a couple of, of properties and then drive back into your area where you need to grow. It was not being efficient. But now that doing this acquisition, all of a sudden I had a multiple of properties in that area, which made it great to where I could grow into and have some, so much more prospects. For and why customers. acquire and not just blitz that market, like identify a geographic market and blitz it with advertising, you know, cut everybody down on price and just, you know, just to, just to basically acquire that business. Why buy a company as opposed to kind of go in and compete? to win those customers? Well, it was, it was a, for me, it was a no brainer. To me, it was just an easier, uh, uh, an easier path of going ahead and, and acquiring instead of trying to go one by one and trying to break into those certain areas uh, that you would like to get into and spend all the money on, on marketing. Why spend the money on the marketing on a hope that you're going to get new work when you could acquire and all of a sudden, you have that work instantaneously. Yeah, well said. How did you go about ensuring that those contracts would transfer over to you, both the residential and commercial contracts? Because when you acquire a company, obviously, you're yes. buying. <laughs> you hope that mm -hmm. those customers you stay did loyal. Stay with what you. did you do to, to try to keep them sticky? Um, the best thing was we did give them a notification letter, but the notification letter did state that the current uh, or the, the, the past owner was going to stay on board uh, as part of the team. However, nothing else was really going to change. The, all the intra, uh, integral parts of the business uh, from management to the employees, we weren't going to change the crews. Some, some, some of these customers like the same crew foreman and you know, that, that could be an issue. So we weren't going to change any of that aspect. Uh, we were just going to add to and add more customers in the round the area. And uh, that was a big key factor, I think, because uh, some people uh, would like to stay with a service business that they know and they trust. Um, but when there's always change, there's always, you know, the apprehension that they might uh, change things up. So I try to not change much in the service part at all. Uh, went with that acquisition and it worked out fabulously. I, I don't think we lost, we lost very few, maybe one to 2% on that acquisition. Wow. It was how great. Did you, how did you value the company for the purposes of that acquisition? Like, was it a multiple of SDE or, or profitability or EBITDA? Like, how did you kind of come up with a, a value in your head of what to pay? It was more of a profitability when I did this purchase, um, but on the background, I had to put a price on the areas that he was in compared to where I was not in, to where how much would I had to spend, as we talked about earlier, on, on marketing, on trying to get out there and, and blitz those areas. Um, so it was based a little bit on his profitability, um, the the actual uh, customers that he had too. Uh, this, at this time in twelve, I was very heavy on residential. I was probably eighty percent on residential, eighty five percent. He had the majority of commercial. So this is what kind of tipped the scales for me um, to where I was willing to pay a little bit more to now really bust into the commercial market and um, 
be able to take off on that. So there was a few factors on that acquisition uh, to where it wasn't slowly on EBITDA. Um, it was more on its profitability, where he was, uh, how much would I have to actually uh, dump into the company for marketing in order to get to where he was at. Uh, so there was a few factors. That what multiple that of EBITDA did you, did you pay? On that one, it was right at, I think, three to three and a half. Got it. Got it. Curious to know, how did you retain employees? Uh, I'd Mm. imagine, again, I I don't know this to be the case, but I'd imagine every Tom, Dick and Harry with a lawnmower thinks he can be, or she can be, uh, you know, lawn care person. And so what did you do to A, ensure they didn't steal your customers and B, retain them? Are those issues that you thought about? Oh, absolutely. In this line of business down here, especially in the uh, the Houston area market, um, it, it is tough to find some some loyal employees. <laughs> they uh, they'll they'll definitely leave you if they if they get a, a higher offer on compensation. Uh, with these new ones, what I did uh, to earn the new employees' respect on this acquisition was I actually went out there and worked with them side by side a little bit, got to know them, talk to them a little bit, find out about their family, make them seem a little bit more that you care. Um, and I think that went a long way with, with a few of the guys uh, with that uh, acquisition to where I think five key guys ended up staying with me from 12 from that first acquisition, mm-hmm. that first major acquisition that we did. So um, how, how many treating- employees did did you have, like when you acquired that business, how many new employees were you taking on effectively? Uh, I, that time I took on another uh, 12 to 14, if I believe. And I had okay. currently around 10. So it. it was, and here's, this was a very interesting part because you have the, the old uh, company, which at that time was designer, but I decided to take Greenleaf's name. And you have the old company designer employees now having to mesh with, Greenleaf employees, um, they had a little bit uh, different idealism on how to do work or how to complete work. So that was all a uh, very interesting uh, part of the acquisition of trying to get these guys meshed together, acquainted, and work together as one solid team. I bet. I bet. Listen, I'd love to dig in a little bit more on the Greenleaf acquisition. So it was you know three to three and a half times EBITDA. Um, how did you structure that? Was it like 100% cash up front or was there a portion that was paid over time? Like how did, how, how was the kind of structure? Uh, I was blessed at that time. We structured that to where I did get, have a bank loan for that. And then um, he did also uh, owner finance uh, to me a, a bit of that uh, money with some down payment uh, as well. And um, that was uh, structured over a, a seven year term. I see. What proportion was owner financed? Uh, That's a good question. I think the owner finance part was roughly 30%. Got it. So for those folks doing an acquisition, if they're thinking in their head, like, how would I, how would I get this money? So a bank loaned you a portion. Correct. Do you have to give them a personal guarantee for that? Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I don't think banks do. <laughs> I, <can give> <laughs> I don't think so money. either. Yeah. Okay. So the bank lends the money, but you're on the hook personally. And Absolutely. then they're, the owner uh, effectively lends you money to buy them, buy their company effectively. In this case, it was around um, 30%. Correct. And, and you're paying that over a seven year term. Mm-hmm. And so, in, in a lot of ways, I guess that makes that former owner somewhat motivated to stick around and make sure it's successful because they want to get their, their money, right? Yeah, yes, uh, to a point. I think he knew uh, this, this was an interesting one because it, is a, it was a local acquisition, uh, so I was really his competitor. So he knew who I was. He knew my worth at work ethic. He knew he felt comfortable enough that, well, I'm just not going to take this and just run it into the ground. I was already in the business, uh, you know, and just acquiring and trying to grow. So um, he felt comfortable enough on that. Uh, I think I can't speak for him, but I, I think that's the reason why he he went ahead and decided to go to sell to me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Did he stick around for the seven years? 
No, no, uh, he was gone. <laughs> he went away pretty quickly. Uh, he was, uh, I would say he was probably gone after about three months. It was quick. And what impact did that have on the company? Not too much. Um, like I said, I want to try to earn the respect of the current employees. I didn't have any jump ship um, to where it, you got to get a comfort level with them to be sure that, uh, you know, they're okay with it. It's, it's, it was a little bit of a change because they had a different location to drive to, which wasn't too far, uh, but it's changed. Nevertheless, it's changed and uh, you're going under a new boss. So I think w- with those, uh, those things where I was trying to make the, the employees feel more comfortable, um, it worked out, it worked out good and it didn't have any effect when the old company or when the old, old owner had left. Got it. And, and were you able to pay the, the seven years, whatever the, the payout associated with his uh, sale price? Oh yeah, absolutely. It was actually paid out early. We were done after four, I think with everything. Oh, that's so, great. Yeah. You know, help me understand something. <sighs> Acquiring a company, it's obviously a huge asset. It, it requires uh, that you put up a personal guarantee for a bank loan. What was your, how did you get comfortable with that amount of debt? (laughs) What was, did you tell your spouse? Was that, you know, like a conversation you guys? Yeah, that's it. That was super tough because like I said, it was a huge leap of faith. Here I am. I'm going to take a personal guarantee. Yes, uh, I I do know the business, but I'm going to go into some severe amount of debt right off the bat. and man, I hope this works. And it was, it was a huge leap of faith, but most business owners are risk takers, but they got to be calculated risk takers. In order but how did you successful. get comfortable with it personally? What was your, like, I'm serious. Did you tell your spouse? Did you have the discussion? What was their reaction? Absolutely. Like, how did you get comfortable with it? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, my wife uh, now almost 20 years, uh, when I, when I talked to her, it was a, it was a huge, conversation but she's such a a great partner that she said look you know the business you know what you're doing it's nothing really new you're just growing you're you're going to have a huge growing pain immediately overnight you you'll be able to handle it and you know i think she was a very driving uh motivation factor um for for that to say you know what we're going to, we're going to do this. We're going to take this leap of faith and we're going to grow. We're going to triple overnight and we're going to keep going. And that's exactly what we did. We kept going after that. And to be clear, does she work in the company? No, she does not. As a matter of fact, no, she, she has her own uh, separate um, uh, job that she does. And, and uh, yeah, she, uh, uh, she'll get some general background on what's going on with work. But other than that, we're just concentrating on family and running around with three kiddos. (laughs) <laughs> ah, nice. So how did the second acquisition work? I'd be particularly interested if you did anything differently the second time around. No, the, the second acquisition, it was nice because it was a, <laughs> it was a smaller acquisition. It wasn't something to triple again. So this second acquisition was a strategic part for me that eventually I wanted to uh, make an exit in this line of business. But I wasn't there yet to where my goal was, I wanted to sell out to a nationwide company. I wanted a, like a nationwide company to come in and have a major instant presence in a major city like Houston, Texas. And I wasn't there yet at that time, uh, before the second acquisition, I was there for only with seven crews, around uh, 25 guys. And, and I said, no, I need to grow a little bit more. So the second acquisition was, uh, they had three crews, and an additional, I think, close to a dozen men, 10 to a dozen men on. And um, once again, this was extremely strategic on commercial customers, because this is where I was trying to drive now, trying to to wane out a little bit of the residential, push a lot more towards commercial, because you are a lot more marketable if you have commercial customers compared to those residentials. Why? Um, I think there's a... uh, strategic move on that where it's basic of if you have one crew, uh, you're a much more efficient 
for if that crew did one start and stop and worked at one giant HOA compared to 25 start and stops driving around, you're just not as efficient. So your bottom line profit is actually higher on those commercial ones, as long as you get them bid out correctly. Got it. So you figured, if I'm paraphrasing, that by picking up more commercial business, you'd be more attractive to an acquirer. Absolutely. Absolutely are in this line of business. Correct. That's helpful for sure. So you go in and buy this smaller company, again, similar deal, like was it a similar multiple of EBITDA or yes. different? No, it was a pretty much, it, it was pretty much the same structure. Um, this one was uh, very smooth as well. This one, I was not nearly uh, nervous about. Uh, and uh, this one, I did not uh, have to go to the bank to finance as well. So it, it worked out very well. And it, all it did was just uh, expand uh, where I was, expanded my presence, um, out there and um, it, it worked out perfectly, it worked out beautifully this second. Similar night. multiples, kind of three to three and a half? Yes, yes, and exactly. The, and the, yes. Uh, the seller taking some financing back? No, he did not take any financing back, so we okay. were able to, to, to pay this out. Got it, got it. That's helpful for sure. So you had this idea that you wanted to sell. What was... Mm -hmm. Was that something that you, because a lot of people think, you know, I don't really want to sell, you know, like I'm going to hand the kids the business or, uh, you know, I'll, I'm going to go out boots first, as they say, you know, sell, you know, like <laughs> what, what was motivating you to want to sell or build to sell if, effectively? The biggest driving factor for me was spending more time with my family, especially while my kids are young. Life is too short here. In a blink of an eye, you have, if you do have kiddos, or we all have kids, a lot of us have kiddos, in a blink of an eye, they're five, in a blink of an eye, they're 15, and time flies by so quick. And I did not ever want to have to say, man, I wish I, wish I was there for that, or, or I wish I could have made it for this. And that was getting to, to, to eat on me a little bit um, to where I wanted to go ahead and exit out of this company and that was a big driving factor it's more just just more family time to spend more time and in retrospect now that you've had a bit of time to reflect on that was that were you missing those events or or was it more just kind of in your head you know what i mean what were you actually At, missing key key events being in Oklahoma? um it, it was wanting to be more involved with my kids now and not not necessarily missing key events as for games um, I pretty much made all of the games, but being more involved, even like I wanted to, to coach, I would love mm -hmm. to coach my kids, but that's, that's a very, uh, driving, um, uh, uh, factor of having the time to do it and cutting mm -hmm. off. And, uh, I, I didn't have that uh, as much. So now it's, uh, I have that time to where I, I love it. I'm, I'm, I'm drawing up football plays so now for my, for my boy. <laughs> You know, different stuff like that. But it was, yeah. and I was truly blessed to where at my age where I could say, I'm, I'm ready to exit. I'm ready to spend some more time with my family. And then I'll, I can eventually move on to some other things. So let, that's helpful. Let's get into the actual sale itself. Mm -hmm. So you make the decision to sell. What, what was the next step? Um, the next step was obviously finding the right broker. Um, there were... Uh, there's multiple different brokers out there and how they approach, how they approach uh, trying to sell your business. So at that time, I think I interviewed four different brokers and um, there was one that just stood out ab above the rest. And I like what made them approach. stand out. Um, the, uh, the company's name was uh, Gilbert and Purdue. And when I met with uh, Matt Gilbert on this, what made it stand out was um, the, the um, the information that they would put forward and they would kind of go and actually headhunt for you, not just necessarily uh, take the listing and stick it on a website and say, well, you know, we'll wait until someone calls us. Um, he had um, a network of people, uh, business uh, capitalists that would, you know, possibly invest. And he had a lot of different uh, avenues to go about to put this business out on a uh, uh, on the market and and that's what I really appreciated uh, about 
uh, working with uh, Gap. Business Great. Drive. So Matt was saying, hey, look, I'm going to market this thing. I'm not just going to be passive and let, you know, got Absolutely. it. So what was the next step there? I mean, did he, did he market it? Did, did, did you get sort of multiple in, people interested? Like, what was that like? What, what was great about this is and then I kind of went through a, um, a financial overview, number one, with, with his team to even see so many people are saying, yeah, I'm, I want out. I want to sell my business. Well, <laughs> I think the percentage is very low, maybe 1% uh, that when you finally look at the numbers and you're going to say, okay, yes, this company's worth selling <laughs> compared <laughs> to so many other businesses are like, you know, you, you got to you got to boost these numbers up to even make it marketable. So I did go through that with Matt. Um, that came out very well. And then what they did is I kind of went through a interview with their team on a confidential business overview. And this was, I think, a, a big driving factor of what probably sold the company. It was a, a booklet uh, per se or information packet of probably over 30, 35 different pages, colored pages, information, all the financial numbers, what we did. Um, it was uh, a great information tool that he used and handed out to uh, certain companies after, of course, they got a, a, a non-disclosure. Uh, how uh, big are you at this point, Tom? Like how many, like how much revenue, how many employees, like what, what's the size that uh, uh, you guys currently, have? and then currently at the time of sale, I was right at, I'm at 10 crews and over 35 full-time employees. Okay, so this is a, a, a reasonably significant business just to give f folks the scope. So you're 35 or so employees. He puts together this offering memorandum or this, this deck that describes what you, what you do. Then, then what happens? What, what's the next step? Uh, obviously, he, uh, he did put out what were one-page teasers, which uh, kind of, he floated those out in, into uh, circulation with his different avenues. And um, we ended up uh, getting quite a few people uh, interested. And then with that, uh, I had at that time, probably I've had three or four different offers. And um, there were some driving factors of why I didn't go with those first three. Uh, and then the fourth one just seemed to be right to where we could sell out. Well, okay. So l give me the range. Uh, if, if you can give me a range of kind of multiples between the four offers, uh, sort of what was the low end and what was the sort of high end? Um, the, the multiple wasn't necessarily the primary driving factor. Um, okay. but this multiple was, I think right around, uh, four, Three and a half to four was a multiple, mm -hmm. um, okay. but the driving factor as well was how the structure of payment was going to be. Um, and I did not, I was not really necessarily willing to uh, owner finance a huge chunk of it, mm -hmm. um, uh, depending on who the potential buyer was or if he was already in the line of business. Uh, same, the same scenario when I acquired uh, before, you know, I think he felt comfortable with me because I was in the line of business. So those were some of the driving factors of who I decided to go with. Uh, the, in the, three, the three offers that you did not decide to go with, I'm assuming that the, the proportion of owner financing was relatively high. Is that what you're, is that what made them just um, unattractive? No, one was uh, a gentleman who was not ever in this line of business, had mm. the finances for it. Uh, but in, in general well-being of my employees, uh, I want the business to succeed, obviously, and keep sure. going. Um, so that was a huge um, roadblock for me for that one. Um, mm -hmm. The other gentleman uh, was not in the line of business as well, but uh, then he wanted a significant amount of owner finance as well. And I think he was kind of just struggling with, uh, trying to get the bank loans for it. Mm -hmm. um, so those are a couple of them that I remember offhand. And then the, the, the final offer one was uh, a gentleman that was in the line of business and um, the, the finances were right to where I only had at that time. I was only going to owner finance, uh, I think, around 15%. One five. 
Mm -hmm. Got it. And yes. that's the one you ultimately went with? Yes, sir. Yeah. How do you structure the interest rate on that? Because I mean, man, interest rates are so low right now. Like, right. Is it, like what was the interest rate that you got on the portion that you financed, the, albeit a small portion? I think that interest rate was at five five. Oh, okay. So not, I mean, not bad relative to no, what you get at the not, bank I'm, right now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. So I think it was, it was right, right around five, five. It was, it was a fair amount. I, I believe a fair amount. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's helpful. How would you describe the next step, the kind of diligence phase where you've agreed, but there's a query that they've got to kind of check you guys out? Uh, this was, this was an interesting deal because, um, the potential buyer at that time came in in February of this year. Um, it was early February, if I remember correctly. And um, he uh, did his diligence. Uh, what sold it, once again, was with Gilbert and Purdue, this confidential business overview that they did. It, it basically shows, it lays everything out uh, of what our company does, the financials. Uh, from him reviewing that, and then we did. He did fly down uh, from uh, South Carolina, and we did have a, a, a meeting and um, showed him the facility and, and, of course, you know the operations, what was going on. I think he felt a um, a, a comfort there to where he was uh, ready to go ahead and, and proceed and, and move on it. Hmm. Got it. If you could do one thing differently through the whole sale process, what, what might you have a mulligan on or a do-over? The, the, my biggest hang-up when I was putting this business up for sale because of the, the um, competitiveness of your competitors was I was very leery to sell to someone local. Um, even though, yes, of course, they sign a non-disclosure and then you open up your books and you, you basically open up your books to whatever your contract amounts are <laughs> for mm. what you're mowing uh, around. So that was a big hang up for me. Um, so originally I did tell my broker, I don't want you to uh, market this anywhere local. Um, now looking back, uh, I maybe probably would have changed that and said, okay, open it up to, uh, open it up to everyone in the market to see what we could get out there. Um, because it did take a while to sell. We had the business up for sale for, um, close to two years by the time wow. it closed. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. What was that like that two year stretch? It was actually fine. Um, it, it, my business was not a business in distress. My business was making great money. Um, I was just uh, ready to move on. I, I wanted to spend more time with the kiddos and uh, do something maybe more in a consulting role to where I have more free time. And um, it was fine. Uh, I didn't really stress out about it too much because the business was making profitable margins and we were just trucking along. And were you worried at all that either your employees were fi would find out or your customers would find out that the business was for sale? Yeah, that's always a big, big factor. Um, because once again, here you have change and, and you have these uh, now 35 employees that are, and a lot of them were like family to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew their kids' names and, you know, you, you try to have a little bit of intricate part with your employees that, um, that is a tough thing to keep under wraps. Um, the, I did eventually share with, uh, with my office employees, the ones that working inside the office that what the scenario was, uh, approximately once we did have it under contract, it was supposed to originally close April 1st. Uh, so I did let them know by, um, beginning of March, what was going, going to be happening. And uh, they all seemed to be okay and on board with it um, because I wasn't just going to dump them and leave. Uh, obviously, I was going to be there to be sure the transition time was going to be good for them. But we did not tell any field employees um, at that time, nor did we tell any customers. And what was their reaction when you did tell them? Um, the employees, uh, it's uh, always a sense of apprehension. Uh, what's next? Who is the new owner? 
what is going to happen. Um, but we did not, uh, from, from what I can remember, I don't think we lost one employee, hmm. uh, which was a, a, a true blessing. Uh, Customer-wise, uh, we sent out a notification letter. And um, with that, uh, we, uh, I think we lost a few, couple, four or five residentials. That's about it. We did not lose any commercials uh, right off the bat there. Um, as a matter of fact, some of my old time residentials, uh, customer, residential customers after 25, 20, 28 years called me <laughs> and said, and, and said, you know, Tom, I, I'm so proud of you. I remember when you were so young and you had that drive and you had that vision and you made it a reality that you sold and congratulations to you. And that's, that, that made me feel really good at heart because it, it, it's been a long road. It's been 30 years that I've been in this business and I had a vision and I actually completed it. Well, I'm looking at you on, on screen and those who are watching Tom on, on YouTube will know this, that 30 years, you must've started pretty young. <laughs> I'm guessing yes, you're did. a teenager. Yes, I, pushing yes, a I, was. I was pushing a lawnmower at 15 years old. Yes, sir. And that's about told me I'm 45 years old and, and blessed enough to say I'm kind of semi-retired. But uh, yeah, I had that drive ever since I was young uh, to go out there. There's always a way to make a dollar if you're willing to work. If you can work, you got two able hands to do it, you can do it. It, yeah. it can be done. And, and I'm a true testament to that. Yes, you are for sure. You know, I'd love to just sort of spend a minute on life after the sale. So r remind me when the deal closed. Uh, the deal closed, this was an interesting one because the deal closed June 1st. Originally, it was supposed to close April 1st. Uh, and then uh, COVID hit. Right. So this, this was a, a kind of a, a new for all of us, the broker, the buyer, the seller. Uh, what are we doing here? Um, we were blessed enough as a uh, maintenance company we were listed as essential to, to go ahead and keep working for the safety and maintenance of, of properties. And um, so uh, the potential new buyer did want to come back down to just do another revisit and couldn't at that time because of COVID, April, very few people were flying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that, that April 1st got pushed to May 1st. Um, COVID was still blowing up. So the May 1st got finally pushed to June 1st. And uh, after June 1st, um, the, the new owner said, okay, this is going to happen. We're going to make this go uh, as long as, you know, he was a little apprehensive too because he didn't know what the COVID effects were going to be financially for us as the business. It didn't affect us one bit, thank goodness, because like I said, 90% of it was um, regular scheduled maintenance. The grass is growing in Houston, Texas. <laughs> you yeah. got to cut it every week. So, it's outside uh, as well. Which is it's good. outside as well. Yeah. And um, we still had you know, PPE for our guys wearing masks and, they, and wearing gloves at that time, we were having them wear gloves. And, um, and so that worked out okay to where we finally did close on June 1st. Got it. So it's been about almost four months. We're recording this at the end of September. What has been the most surprising thing for you in those four months? I'm thinking in particular about sort of emotions you may have felt uh, that you weren't sort of expecting over the last four months. Um, emotionally detached from it, yes. Um, I was ready. Um, so, some people may have apprehension, I'm sure there has been in the past, of people that uh, sold their company and they have a, just a huge emotional attachment to it. Oh my gosh, I built this from mm -hmm. ground zero, which is what I did. But I had a plan implemented really from, from day one. This is where I want to go. And I want to get to the point to where I build a company to where I can turn in cash in and sell out to a nationwide company and then move on to something else. So I already had it in my head that way. Um, on the emotional side, I think we, I didn't have uh, any apprehension uh, as for that. Um, a little different for me because I always had my office at my, my shop location. And now that the new owner is, is leasing that property, I got out of my office over there. So I was so used to going to a place as an office to where now I'm in a home office. 
So this is a little different for me. Um, yeah. Maybe uh, I should interview your spouse about how she likes having Tom yeah, around that much. She <laughs> says you got to go back to work. Don't find yeah. something. <laughs> Get um, out so of the that, house. That's exactly right. Yeah. No. So it's a little different for me on that aspect too, because you got three kiddos coming in and out, you know, or someone comes to the door, dogs are barking and a, little, a few more distractions. So a little bit different um, uh, for me, but uh, I do have some, some plans in the future uh, where I'm going to go to where hopefully I can get out of this home office back into another office of mine. <laughs> Did you have, uh, you know, you mentioned a couple of times that it, it was your goal to build a, a business to where it would be attractive to a national acquirer. Did you have a number that you wanted to build your business to that when you achieved that sort of financial number that you were going to sell it? Like, was that part of your thinking? There was a number yeah, in your head? yeah, I just kind of had a, a, a set number. I did have a set number in my head. Um, and it was to the fact of how big I was on the cusp of having to bring in another general manager if I grew a little bit more. And I didn't know if I necessarily wanted to take on uh, that extra obstacle. So I got it to the point to where all the intricacies of the business was basically running itself. Um, I could go away for two, three weeks if I wanted to, the business was going to run itself. So I got to that point to where I was like, Okay, I think this is the right medium for me to now go ahead and 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 sell out, and then the new prospective owner, if he wants to build it more, bring in another general manager, uh, and and take this even higher and beyond, he can. So that was kind of a driving factor for me with that, and then that's where we got to ten crews, thirty five guys. Um, it was uh, it was the sweet spot for me to go ahead and sell out. That's helpful, and the number in your mind. What did that represent? Like if you were to, to uh, achieve an exit that, that ticked that box or on that number, mm -hmm. I guess where I'm going with this is sort of why was that important? What did that number represent to you? That number represented to me to where I, if I had enough money um, to where I could uh, take some of this money, reinvest, which is what I'm doing into commercial real estate. Uh, I already have, uh, some other commercial real estate properties uh, to where I could take a little bit more of that, invest into those and bring residual income in every month from those, uh, from those properties to where I could do a little extra side work as, as for consulting, I wouldn't mind doing a lot of consulting for service businesses, help them um, and still have all that free time to do what I want to do with, with my family and my kids and my wife. That was Got a big it. driving factor. That's super helpful. Um, I know people are going to want to reach out. What's the best way for them to do that? Uh, to, is there a website you could send people to, or do you, do you take LinkedIn connections? What's I do have a LinkedIn. I do have a LinkedIn uh, connection. Uh, it's under Tom Farinacci. Um, uh, and also, if on an email, I'll open my email out too as well. Uh, it's Tom T O M dot Farinacci F is in Frank A R I N a C C I at outlook.com. That's great. Tom, thanks for doing this. Yes, sir. I appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Oh my gosh. My pleasure. Thanks for listening to Built to Sell Radio with John Warlow. For complete show notes with links to additional resources, visit builttosell.com slash blog. John is the founder of the Value Builder System. To find out how to improve the value of your business by 71%, visit valuebuildersystem.com. John is also the author of Built to Sell, creating a business that can thrive without you, and the automatic customer, creating a subscription business in any industry. Connect with John at facebook.com slash built to sell or on Twitter at John Warlow, W-A-R-R-I-L-L-O-W. -L 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 Thanks for listening.